Who makes the Nazis? across the Atlantic now, or at least our focus, our attention is, not to look at what the water companies are like over there, but to look at what is happening at Mar-a-Lago, the sort of centre of, of Donald Trump's universe, his, his Florida resort. For those of us who've been fairly clear on just how depraved and fascistic Donald Trump was from, from the very beginning, it's become almost dispiriting to, to track the emerging evidence and forgive me of how right we were, because it still doesn't move the needle, you know. One of his key cheerleaders, Alex Jones, the InfoWars uh, uh, character, has had his comeuppance in court this week, $50 million fines for vicious, vicious lies about the Sandy Hook school massacre. But Nigel Farage, who of course was a big, big Alex Jones collaborator, um, has just moved his grift to CPAC, this this sort of very, very right-wing conference where they roll out red carpets for people like Victor Orban. And Farage now gives exactly the same spiel about Judeo-Christian values being under threat, which is, uh, you know what that's shorthand for, on, on the stage that Donald Trump shares that he used to do on Infowars. So the, the fear that none of it ever sticks has become quite acute in recent months. Which takes us to events overnight. The FBI have raided Mar-a-Lago, um, Donald Trump's sort of Camelot. And it looks, again, like perhaps the, it presages something rather serious. But don't ask me, ask Brian Class. Um, he is, as you'll know, the professor of global po associate professor in global politics at UCL and the author of Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us. Brian, what's happened and how big a deal is it? Well, the FBI has raided Mar-a-Lago overnight looking for documents that are classified that Trump allegedly took with him after he left the White House, and that's a crime. There is a Presidential Records Act that requires the preservation of those uh, records. We know Trump took some boxes. He also has now infamously been, been known to have shredded documents during his presidency, including sometimes flushing them down the toilet. Um, Just so pause there have, for uh, me. Just have... pause, pause, pause for a second, Brian, because people <laughs> may be hearing that for the first time, and, and there has actually photographic evidence has emerged of shreds of uh, torn up pieces of paper featuring Donald Trump's headlines sort of loitering unflushed in toilet bowls which means that his key aides took those people close to him took those pictures for for, for posterity or possible legal defense I mean incredible scenes really I think Maggie Haberman got hold of the pictures first that's right. And, you know, it's it's incredibly ironic because Trump, if you remember back in 2016, ran on the premise that Hillary Clinton couldn't be trusted <laughs> with classified information because she had a private email server, which was secure. Uh, Trump has basically taken documents from the White House, apparently illegally, which is why the FBI broke into his safe last night. And also, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of criminal investigations. He's facing election fraud investigations in Georgia, investigations related to criminality around the January 6th insurrection, investigations in New York about real estate fraud. I mean, the list goes on and on. So it, it, it is heartening to see that someone who has so blatantly flaunted rule of law and, and sort of challenged the American state to say, actually, the rule of law does apply to everyone, uh, is finally seeming to at least face some level of investigation that's commensurate with the actions that he's uh, undertaken. Um, I just, so, looking at the dates, Christopher Wray, the, the, the current director of the FBI, who put him in post? <laughs> he was handpicked by President Trump himself, so he's, he's hardly the deep state democratic stooge that Trump now says he is, because Trump had a choice of who to pick, and he picked Christopher Wray. This is the psychology rather than the politics, and it, I mean, you can almost ask this question in the context of a hundred different issues on both sides of the Atlantic, but how can Trump's most diehard supporters not understand how ridiculous it is to accuse somebody handpicked by Donald Trump of being part of some anti-Trump conspiracy? Because this is a system in which loyalty to Trump is the only variable that matters. And for those people, any time that somebody goes against Trump, it is proof in itself 
that they have now become part of the deep state or part of a plot against President Trump. It's a dynamic that I have seen in deeply dysfunctional authoritarian regimes around the world where loyalty to an individual trumps everything else in politics. And that is the grip that Trump has on the Republican Party, unfortunately, where, where there's a litmus test for future Republican candidates, that is basically one issue. Do you agree with President Trump and do you parrot everything he says unquestioningly? If so, you have a very good shot of winning a Republican primary. If not, you are going to be challenged by someone who's willing to toe the Trump line. I mean, at least there's a reward involved in this. Um, some people in this country would be asking similar questions about loyalty to Boris Johnson being displayed by some politicians and media outlets. But with them, there's not, I suppose there might be a peerage for a former editor or a seat in the House of Lords for an ex MP, but it is, it, it, it's, it's, I mean, the stakes are lower in many ways in the UK than they are for Republicans in America. But the, 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 the context, the precedent, the thing with Trump, and you know this, you've written about it, you understand it better than I do. And, and Bannon has almost sort of said it out loud, hasn't he, about flooding the area with so much sewage that, that none of it actually matters. With Trump, there's so much, so much depravity, so much investigation, so much alleged criminality that you, struggle to perhaps understand the significance of this episode. You just used the phrase, the FBI broke into the safe of a man who was president 10 minutes ago. Yeah, you know, I think this is something where people have lost the ability to be shocked because mm. so many shocking things happened during the Trump era. And I think we need to remember that this is something that we have to expect much more of our politicians. We have this lowest common denominator, and I, I would argue this is true on this side of the Atlantic as well, mm. that you sort of just expect politicians to follow what's in their best interest of power and money. And you sort of just say, well, what can you expect? And you know what? We can expect better. We, we can expect politicians who behave with integrity, but we have to reform the system because Trump is the byproduct, as many of the scandals in British politics are, of a broken system. And when that is replaced, when that is fixed, that's when we'll have politicians who stop breaking the law and start serving the public. And, uh, well, happy days. And what happens next? We don't know exactly what they were looking for, the FBI. Neither they nor the Justice Department have commented on this search. Um, you, you've listed some of the areas that are currently under investigation, so we can't really speak with full confidence about what this likely presage is. But, but what, what, what would the next chapter look like, do you imagine? Well, the way I think about this is sort of like criminal whack-a-mole, right? There's so many allegations and so many potential crimes mm. that eventually one of them is going to get him. And, and we have substantial evidence of criminality in many of these cases. I mean, in Georgia, he literally picked up the phone and was recorded telling his subordinate to find 11,000 votes so he could win the election. I mean, in, in authoritarian countries, that is just blatant election rigging. Yeah. And in the United States, it is currently something that has gone unpunished. So at some point, I suspect that there will be indictments. It will create massive political shockwaves in the United States because the Republicans will cry foul. But, you know, frankly, as an observer who's objective looking at the evidence, it's pretty clear that there has been a lot of criminality in and around the Trump White House, and it's hard to imagine that Trump was not involved in it. Um, finally, Brian, a word, if you would, about this CPAC, which a lot of Brits don't fully understand. What, what, what is it and how ugly is it now? Well, CPAC used to be the sort of who's who of the conservative political movement. And this meant that people running for office and running for president would sort of make their speeches. And to be honest, in the past, it was a bit more innocuous because you'd have people make their firebrand speeches. But now it's it's sort of a who's who of authoritarians. I mean, you bring Viktor Orban in from Hungary, he gets huge applause. And they have an actual installation, what they call an art installation, of a January 6th convicted insurrectionist in prison outfits, an orange jumpsuit, uh, crying and people praying around him. I mean, it is something that does not exist in any other industrialized democracy in the world. It's very dangerous that this is one of the two main political parties in the most powerful country uh, on the planet. And smack in the middle of it, Viktor Orban, who has recently been talking about how the uh, uh, people of different ethnicities shouldn't reproduce together and our own, our very own Nigel Farage. That's right. It's uh, it's incredibly, incredibly depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Class, basically, say that again. Um, Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us is um, one of those books that actually 
helps to clear the clouds because clarity and understanding are always going to be the best weapons of disinformation and um, and fascism, let's call it what it is. And Brian, of course, also Associate Professor at UCL. And I think having spoken to Brian Class about events in America and the um, uh, sort of involvement of that great stain upon British politics, that great skid mark upon the underpants of British politics, Nigel Farage, um, I, I, I think we will talk a bit about Alex Jones, actually. A few of you have asked me why I haven't. And the short answer to that is I'm not an expert on it. I know what you're thinking. Well, there's lots of you not an expert on anything, pal. Doesn't stop you shooting your mouth off about all that. But I almost feel a bit embarrassed about not paying attention to this corner of, of media. Because there was a British equivalent to, to it as well. There was a very old bloke who used to make videos in his mum's basement who was like the British strand of, of info wars. This astonishingly um, uh, uh, corrupt organization that peddled all sorts of lies about all sorts of things and and the british guy perhaps inevitably was praised in andrew neil's spectator magazine at around the time that andrew neil was somehow managing to abide by bbc's impartiality rules so you know that might be part of the reason why many people in this country didn't realize how bad it was and of course nigel farage was popping up on it with unerring regularity imagine that i, I mean imagine knowing that you are collaborating with and therefore validating and perhaps implicitly delivering audience to someone who's accused the families of, 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 of school massacre victims of being liars and actors. I don't think Farage has a conscience according to how most of us would deploy that word but if you ever have the misfortune of meeting him do ask him about Alex Jones and, and, and just how he um, squared that with his conscience, the, the endorsement, the collaboration with, the frequent appearances on, the programme of a man who lied about, I mean, the most toxic lies, the, the, the most awful lies. And if you think it doesn't matter here, you're wrong, obviously, but Boris Johnson used the phrase deep state recently in the House of Commons. That's, that's a mark of how infected our democracy is by this sort of disinformation. And it, and it has its roots, I think, in in these sort of places. So, what's the appeal? I mean, it, it, I think the reason why I didn't take it seriously until it was too late, until, you know, Steve Bannon was already in the White House, there's another outfit called Breitbart, which is, which is similarly toxic. And around the time little Tommy Ten Names was turning up outside court, um, uh, essentially running the risk of committing contempt of court while claiming that he was actually on the side of, of the victims, that these people achieved a degree of prominence that seemed to me to have interplay. There seemed to be intersections. And I don't get it, and I still don't get it. I know what racism is, I know what bigotry is, I know what desperation to believe that your own pitiful little existence is somehow um, worth more than the black fella over the road, because the alternative is to r recognize the reality of your own choices, and also, of course, your own commitment to a system that treats you like dirt. So the invitation from right-wing politicians and right-wing media to look down your nose and to feel superior to somebody else is the only chance they've ever got of stopping you from realizing whose foot is is actually on your throat and why you are stuck where you're stuck um, and they continue to live the life of Riley. That, that ideology, that politics is, is as old as time. And when someone like Farage starts talking about Judeo-Christian values being under threat um, and, and uh, appearing on the same platforms as Viktor Orban who talked very recently about why uh, white people shouldn't have children with people of colour, they're all on the same team and they're all punting exactly the same philosophies and ideologies. It's just that even now, very few of them come out with it explicitly. Very few of them come out and say it completely explicitly. But there's something about the Sandy Hook defamations that I still actually can't get my head around. And it may be a peculiarly American uh, process. It may be a peculiarly American process. What, and, and during COVID, we learned something, didn't we? During the COVID conversations, we learned something about people wanting to believe things that aren't true. And the judge in this case said something really powerful. Your beliefs do not make something true. So it doesn't matter how many homemade placards 
you've got in your garden shed. It doesn't matter how many people you've made friends with on Facebook who agree with you. It doesn't matter how many uh, gatherings you attend in Trafalgar Square. Your beliefs do not make something true. And the desire to believe that these things are true is, to me, incredible. Because, look, I'll give you two examples of this guy. One from a while ago, uh, another example of, of Andrew Neil's um, uh, uh, journalistic brilliance. This is him interviewing Alex Jones without mentioning that his own magazine, The Spectator, had called the British version of Alex Jones, the British Infowars contributor. Um, I, think, I think they called him a brilliant polemicist or something like that. So he, he never mentioned stuff like that because he was very, very impartial when he was at the BBC. But here is one of those rare uh, examples of, of Andrew Neil being on the right side of an exchange, and it's it's not pretty. Like this, oh, I believed, I believed in... Hey, listen, I'm here to warn people. You keep telling me to shut up. This isn't a game, okay? Our government in the U.S. is building FEMA camps. We have an NDAA where they disappear people now. You have this arrest for public safety, life in prison. You are the worst it, person I've ever interviewed. No, no, it's basically we're off it. with their heads, disappear. David, them, thank you for away. being with us. InfoWars.com. Uh, half Liberty past 11. Rising. You're watching the Liberty Sunday politics. We have an idiot Freedom on the program today. Stop. You Coming will not stop just freedom. 20 minutes. You will not stop the republic. Humanity is awakening. Infowars.com. No, you guys are crazy. I'll be looking Think at the week ahead with our political stupid. panel. You're Until crazy. then, the Think Sunday the politics across know. the You're UK. Crazy. So, uh, you know, why don't you engage with these people? There, there you go, that's why. Also, a free advert for his ludicrous website uh, bellowed into the microphone. But I just couldn't believe that anybody ever took them seriously, even, even when Farage was working here and appearing on InfoWars at the same time. So I've got two questions for you. Why? why and we'll talk a bit about Farage, because he, he came out with some stuff last week or at the weekend that is gross. And again, as with Trump, those of us who told you exactly what he was many moons ago derived no pleasure whatsoever from being proved completely right. But what, why did, why, I mean, how did he get away with it for so long, Alex Jones? And why would Nigel Farage associate with somebody who was perpetrating such disgusting lies? The second question is very interesting to me because I'd never fully grasped. I found I found Farage. I don't know if you've seen the footage of me interviewing him a few years ago. I found him so easy to destroy, so easy to to pull apart and bounce around the studio like a ping pong ball. That I struggle still to understand why other journalists never did it, and also why he managed to exercise such curious power over the British electorate. I understand the appeal of base racism and and and, and comforting lies. But it was so easy to show him for what he is, so easy to, to, to point out what he is, that I have a sort of bizarre fascination with it. Why would he consort with and collaborate with Alex Jones of Infowars after the Sandy Hook lies had been injected into public discourse? If you follow these matters um, closer than I do, then I, I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts. But the bigger question, and the most important, the more important question, of course, is... Why? How did Alex Jones get away with it? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. The man's bonkers, and here he is in court, being caught essentially with his with his pants on fire. So you did get my text messages, and it said you did. Nice trick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Jones. Oh. Indeed. You didn't give this text message to me. You don't. You don't know where this came from. Do you know where I got this? No. Mr. Jones, did you know that 12 days ago, 12 days ago, your attorneys messed up and sent me an entire digital copy of your entire cell phone with every text message you've sent for the past two years and when informed, did not take any steps to identify it as privileged or protect it in any way. And as of two days ago, it fell free and clear into my possession. And that is how I know you lied to me when you said you didn't have text messages about Sandy Hook. Did you know that? I See, I told you the truth. This is your Perry Mason moment. I gave them my phone and then... Mr. Jones, you need to answer the question. No, I, Did you I, know I, this happened? No, I didn't know this happened. But I mean, I told you I gave them the phone over. And just, but just and answer you the said, question. You said in your deposition, you searched your phone. You said you pulled down the text, did the search function for Sandy Hook. That's what you said, Mr. Jones, correct? And I had several several different phones with this number, but I did, yeah. Well, of course, I mean, that's why you got it. 
No, Mr. Jones, that's not why I asked. My lawyer sent it to you, but I'm hiding it. Okay. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones, Please that's... just answer questions. There's no question. Mr. Bankston also only asked questions. Sure. Mr. Jones, in discovery, you were asked, do you have Sandy Hook text messages on your phone? And you said no. Correct. You said that under oath, Mr. Jones, didn't you? I mean, if I was mistaken, I was mistaken, but you, you got the messages right there. You know what perjury is, right? I just want to make sure you know before we go any further. You know what it is. Yes, I do. I mean, I'm, I'm not a tech guy. I told you I gave, in my testimony, the phone to the lawyers before or whatever, and, and so you got my phone, but we didn't give it to you. No, Mr. Jones. One more time. And please remember, if you need to assert the Fifth Amendment, you can. I need to know that you can do that. But you testified. Okay, so this man is a liar who's just busted lying there. I and mean, we know he's a liar already. He's evil because of all the people that you would choose to malign in pursuit of clicks and giggles and large sums of money. The, 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 the parents of murdered school children, massacred school children, would be very near the bottom of anybody else's list. So he's a liar and he's evil. And he's probably bonkers, whatever we mean by that word. So he's a liar and he's evil and he's bonkers. And it was blatantly and blindingly obvious to anybody paying attention, including, you have to presume, people who were prepared to profit from association with him. And those people include one who became the most powerful man in the world, Donald Trump, and his sort of British poodle, Nigel Farage. And I, d I still don't get that. So... How did Alex Jones get away with it? Why did Alex Jones, why did people believe and support Alex Jones? 03456060973. And the question I'd really like you to answer alongside it is, why did people like Trump and Farage associate with him so closely? Why did they get into bed with him? Because you sit here as a British commentator, or I sit here as a British commentator, and I... I don't, I mean, I just think, crikey, you'd steer clear of him, wouldn't you? If you were off the power. You'd, you'd, and maybe they were shown numbers. Were they shown numbers? The infl I just, I genuinely don't get it. So, how did he get away with it? 03456060973. What did he offer to people that they found so irresistible? And why would a British, failed British politician pursuing the sort of chat show circuit in America, why would Nigel Farage get into bed with Alex Jones? And why would Donald Trump? 03456060973. Because the point I'm trying to make clumsily is that anyone who's just been introduced to this character by the events of the last few days, or indeed the clips of the last few minutes, will just think, well, he's clearly bonkers. He's clearly evil. He's clearly a massive liar. And then you will be staggered to discover that he was a bedfellow of Donald Trump and Nigel Farage, wouldn't you? I mean, genuinely staggered. How could those men, particularly if you like either of them, you can have a go at answering this, how could those men get into bed with this? And why did they do it? What was in it for them? 0345 6060 973. And then, of course, the bigger question, and you may need to be American or have links to America to answer this, because it's got to have something to do with guns, hasn't it? But why? were people so keen to believe his evil lies. I, and I am in, <clears throat> I am in that, fight, that category, I think. I, I, the reason I never took Alex Jones seriously was because he was so obviously bonkers, evil, and lying. But the trick I missed, as, as I also did with Steve Bannon and Breitbart, the trick I missed was how many people were, were lapping it up. How many people were devouring it, believing it, supporting it, culminating in with an example from both sides of the Atlantic, Nigel Farage and Donald Trump both getting into bed with him. So, two questions. Why did they do that? That maybe is answered by the scale of people in the, in the, in the second question, which is, how did he get away with it? Why did people go for it? Why did people go for it? Ryan's in Durham. Ryan, what can you tell us? So, um, hi, James. Hello, um, basically, my... Uh, well, start off, um, I've got a very vested interest in American politics because my wife is American, okay. my in-laws live out there, and uh, I follow this very, very closely because um, I, I get a lot of stuff from my father-in-law. We kind of yeah. friendly debate this back and forward, but he sends me some very crazy stuff. <laughs> but he's, uh, he is one of those people who's kind of gone down this kind of pipeline and is still very much deep in it. Um, 
And the reason people like Alex Jones can get away with this kind of thing and why they're enabled to do what they do is because, uh, I mean, you, you go back to the 1960s when uh, the Republican right kind of galvanized this issue of finding these single issue voters and conglomerating them on one single issue. Right. And that's how they get started with these things. I mean, my father-in-law, he's, he votes on, you know, an, uh, anti-abortion. It's all about protecting the baby. Just say no uh, to, to anything like that. But he sees things like Alex Jones and, you know, yeah. they drag them down into this thing. They say, I'll get you on this single issue thing, you're protecting so the what, baby. What single issue? So, well, so I, I don't know. Is he, is he, he's a, uh, an anti-abortion person, is he, Alex yeah, Jones? Yeah, pro-life. He calls himself so, pro-life. So yeah. your father-in-law starts off with a religious-based conviction, yeah. does he, on this? Because I, I don't want to insult your father-in-law, but, I mean, when you come when it comes to refugees, I doubt he's quite as pro-life as he is when it comes to exactly. unborn. Um, be yeah. Because you get dragged in on this single issue, okay. and the more you hear, the more you learn about the truth, you know, quotation marks, the more you start to see, it, oh, there's more to this than that. There's the refugees coming in, they're enemies, they're rapists, they're whatever, and it gets galvanized by people like Jones and projected and picked up by people so like Donald So you've already Trump lost me, because I'm not unfamiliar with this, particularly Farage, obviously, but the leap from being anti-abortion to, to believing that Sandy Hook was a hoax or believing that, you know, all foreigners are, are criminal, I, I don't quite... that. I guess, so I guess that's because we wouldn't like fall for it. Go on. It might, yeah, it's like a pipeline. They get you in on the one thing, so... But, but like you know, I don't like the abortion argument. I'm pro life. Sure. I'm not. I'm just saying that's where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like for example, yeah, no, I understand. Um, yeah, you see, oh, Alex Jones is saying this, this, and this. You start listening to it more, and then you listen to more of it, and you get more and more of these little ideas that bring you down this pipeline. It's the same way kind of YouTube works with its autoplay yeah, feature. Okay. You see one video, you see more, and the stuff he sends me now isn't Infowars. It's some very, very deep down there stuff that I don't even know where it's coming from. What's the maddest thing he sent you, if you don't mind me asking? The latest thing he sent yeah, me was a documentary yeah. uh, by a, uh, um, a doctor. Yeah, don't advertise that, it. Just give me the content. Oh, no. um, basically, COVID comes from snake yeah. venom. Snake <sighs> venom? Okay. Yeah, that's the last thing I heard. And, um, is it I was so, trying to just... Is it... Because the thing you like, that like the gateway drug, the entry point, yeah, you love that validation and that vindication so 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 much mm. that you kind of then have to buy the rest of it. And because there's a little gnawing voice in the back of your head saying the rest of it isn't true, mm. you to silence that voice, you have to go all in. I, I mean, I maybe we're coming at it from the wrong angle, but but would your father-in-law? have subscribed to the Sandy Hook theory put out by Alex Jones? I mean, I haven't really asked him about no. it. Um, in terms of uh, gun ownership, we just don't go near that. Um, but gun ownership because, is key to understanding yeah. this, because Alex Jones gave people... Because, I mean, look, school massacres in a, in a sane universe would have seen gun laws brought in in any country in, in history, mm. and it hasn't happened in America, which means they're desperately looking for reasons to resist that simple logical leap from school massacres to gun laws and the only way yeah. they can resist it is by claiming that the school massacres aren't actually real so i can understand well, that with, appeal it starts with a single issue for yeah, you've got guns. people who were just no guns no gun laws no regulation nothing my gun my right so you get those on the single issue voters and you start giving them these ideas that maybe it's a false flag maybe they're attacking your gun rights maybe they're getting this <sighs> listen to the truth and, and then what? you start to get this idea of, oh, wait, maybe he's got a point, maybe the Democrats are doing this, and you start to go down this path where you get that other thing, you get that one more little nugget of what seems like the truth that drags you further into these conspiracies before before long, you think COVID comes from snake venom. And the election was stolen. Yeah. It's, um... Why and, would, I mean, we may have just answered the second question, why would, let's start with Farage, because he's British and so are we, why would Farage get into bed with him, even after the Sandy Hook stuff? What would be in it for, for Farage? Probably to kind of bring that kind of um, ideas into Britain to try and find the kind of way to get single-issue voters in Britain to fall down a path of where the truth no longer matters, where the facts don't matter anymore, so that they can be removed from reality, and it kind of worked. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, the Brexit vote was a petri dish for Trump, and it really kind of worked. Like, anyone who was saying this is this is probably going to happen. Oh, you project fear. Yeah. It's all lies, project fear. 
and you think, no, this is this is reality. We're we're removing ourselves from from the largest trading block on the planet. And without, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, well, tell me about it. But without prying on Julie, how, how does your wife feel about uh, what's happened to her dad, or indeed your mother-in-law? If, if you don't mind um, me asking, you don't have to answer that question. Oh, no, it's fine. My, my wife, um, she's kind of, from living in the UK for nearly five years, she's mm. had the outside view of America, and she's, she's really upset about how yeah. America is going. Um, she's upset with how kind of removed from reality her parents have become just because of the one issue on um, access to abortion rights. That's the Is that where it came from? And are they, they're evangelical Christians, are they? Or, or oh, no, they're Catholic. They're full and my wife Catholic. is Catholic. Right. Okay. Um, she, uh, I'm Catholic. She, she's, she, says she's, uh, she says she's pro-life and she yeah. doesn't agree with abortion, but she doesn't agree with where America is taking this kind of argument towards it fair enough so that you just need to find a, a, yeah, very, yeah well it is isn't it and, and you know i mean yeah. the idea that donald trump is somehow a champion of that movement is absurd and, and rather disgusting on every imaginable level thank you yeah. ryan I, I i mean keep, keep in touch I, I, the heads up on what's going to happen next i wasn't surprised that covid was in the was in the latest video i was a little surprised to discover that your father-in-law believes it's it's, it's snake venom but I've seen people go down these rabbit holes, including sort of people I thought I knew. So um, I, I do understand. And in fact, we discovered the best way to have these conversations was not to speak to the actual uh, victims, but to speak to the loved ones of victims. And you get much better insights into into these matters. And, and you've proved that once again. Dorothy's in Westwood Ho. Dorothy, what can you tell us? Good morning, James. Hello. Um, I, I do have to say that your show is a work hazard for those of us who work from home. Um, yes, I can understand that. You should... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, anyway, I, I have to say um, that I think that Alex Jones is actually a descendant of Rush Limbaugh. Okay. So this guy, and, when I started doing this for a living, people used to say yeah. to me, do you know how much Rush Limbaugh earns? He earns something like $200 million a year. And I never yes. really... And, and I had a couple of colleagues um, who admired him and tried perhaps to ape him but I, I, I mean just give Brits a quick thumbnail sketch of what he did and, 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 and why he made so much money. Well well, he he really came to prominence late 80s early 90s and he was a, sort of a conservative talk radio mm. host and it, it, he was actually he became embraced by Bush Senior who invited him to the White House to, to help him you know attract his audience for, as, as voters etc and he was very, um, he appealed to some of the ugliest aspects, you know, called feminist feminazis. Okay, and, so and, hating and, and, women? Yeah, yeah women, um, immigrants, minorities, and playing on that. And, and it wasn't as, as crazy and insane as Alex Jones, what he says, but you talk about desensitization. Yes. And it's kind of the, 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 the degeneration of his thoughts and his train of thought. And it's kind of his listeners are morphing into Alex Jones. Well, if you want to get famous, you'd have to go further. So you'd have to go yeah, further exactly. than Rush Limbaugh to, it, to go to get famous. Well, and, and they saw the money he made. So, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's just, um, and, and, and it does, and the people who listened to him um, kind of progressed on to Alex Jones, you know, yeah. if they discovered social media and internet, I don't know. But um, but it's even happened, you talk about falling down a rabbit hole, it's happened to my brother. Really? Um, yeah, mm. <laughs> and it's, it's quite sad, and you know, to the point that you know he had to go at his niece, my daughter, who's nineteen, um, who who was quite fired up about the overturning of Roe v. Wade. You know, she's yes. a nineteen-year-old university student, you know, and she said something, and then and then and, and, and the likes of the the USA is turning into a third-world country wrapped in a Gucci belt, wow. and he took umbrage to that, <laughs> and um, so it, it's really there's, there's just no. There's what? What then? <laughs> what was actually? Because you're the second person I wasn't expecting abortion to feature so um, uh, prominently in this conversation, and and and, and it's a it's a glib throwaway line. But what is it about abortion that appeals to these people? Because they don't really like humans unless they're exactly like them. They don't. I mean, certainly, you know, you've got desperate people at the border, or or, or I think it's fair to say that the inscription at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty has been completely erased by Donald Trump, how can they be claimed to be pro-life when they're also pro-death penalty and pro-treating life appallingly when it when it's someone desperate fleeing their own country? Yeah, I think there are two things. It's partly it's about control okay. and, and, the, and, and, and the loss of maybe what they see as traditional 
um, roles in society and also the fact mm. that we never underestimate the, the hold that a certain uh, branch of evangelical um, evangelicals, evangelism, I can't even speak Evangelical before. Christianity. Yeah, yeah, it has in the States. And there are people who I've known most of my life who I went to school with, and it, it, you can't, there's no reasoning with it. It's it's like a sort of a, 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 a pornography of fear, things to be frightened of, that they actually somehow find arousing. Wayne in Basildon has used that phrase, hardcore porn fear. I don't I don't know that you would use that phrase, Dorothy, but it, it seems a neat distillation of, of some of what you've described. But that leap, that desire to believe it. And of course, we forgot about sexual autonomy for women being absolutely anathema to a certain type of man, because deep, deep down, they hate women. They hate the fact that they can only ever have sex when a woman agrees and, and pine for the days when you couldn't actually... And that was true in Britain relatively recently, is that it was impossible to rape your own wife. And it matters, doesn't it? You, you can talk about it being good news that, uh, that, that Alex Jones has been spanked in court, but you look at his legacy and, and the fact that most obviously Donald Trump got into bed with him, Nigel Farage got, got into bed with him, many people in this country remain enamoured of both of those individuals. So, I, I, you, you know, the question of how it works, because someone else will come along now, that's the point, isn't it? I think that's something we can all agree about. Someone else will fill, will fill the gap. There's always people nibbling away at the, uh, whichever, whoever is the most prominent hate preacher at the moment, whether it's Hopkins or, or Little Tommy Ten Names in, or, or Farage, or whether it's um, Alex Jones or Rush Limbo, as Dorothy just just reminded us, or Trump himself, um, there's always someone just waiting in the wings, ready for the stage to be vacated, and, and then they'll slide in. So, how, how do they get away with it? And why would abortion, COVID, gun laws, immigration? I mean, what what is it about these issues that you would? Define what, what would be the defining feature? What do they all have in common? Oh uh, three four five, and of course racism. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine at seven three. Levy is in Newquay in Cornwall. Levy, what would you like to say? So uh, it's very nice to speak with you. Likewise. I used to follow some of the beliefs okay. um, that Alex Jones espouses when I was a very young man. Yeah, um, I was I was raised in the American Southeast where they preach tyrannical government is coming to get you. They want to take your guns. They want to take your rights. Okay. So Alex Jones in the early to mid 2000s when I was in university was one of those people who took the stance of the government's coming for your guns. Yeah. As I progressed through university and actually learned about the world around me, your eyes start to open to just how bonkers this person can be. So what he does is he preys on what we would call already vulnerable people. Yeah. The poor, the uneducated, people who are already a little weary of the government itself anyway. Mm. And so, you know, he, he grabs them by playing on the fears and the emotions and things that otherwise would be able to be worked out logically become an emotional response of, Someone could not possibly have walked into a school and murdered 26 children. So this must be a way for the government to take these things away from us. Oh, I see. So it's 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 wrong end of the telescope time, isn't it? It's it's you start with the belief that you are under threat, that they want your guns, and they'll do anything to get them. Once you stop, once you believe they'll do anything to take your guns away then the door is open for something as outwardly bonkers as, as staging a school hoax. Yes, and, and it, it happened massacre. with COVID as well, where they will do anything to get Donald Trump out of office, so COVID is now a massive conspiracy to steal an election. Okay, because it worked. And the, reason, and the reason that people like Trump and Farage will get into bed with a man like Alex yes. Jones and it's also why no one stands up to him, is the the network of people who follow him online is so vast. Is it? That they can, take, they can take a conspiracy such as what the previous caller said of COVID comes from snake venom yeah. and essentially turn it into a, a fact. What is it? Kellyanne Conway called it an alternative fact in uh, 24 hours. And it's all over right-wing news 
And the reason no one stands up to someone like Jones is because that same network will dox, harass, and even show up at the homes of people who question it. And the Sandy Hook parents have finally become the only ones who have been willing to or strong enough to actually stand up to the online harassment and finally get Alex Jones in court and expose him for the fraud that he is. Because, in a sense, they'd already lost the most precious thing they could lose. So the leverage of his supporters is diminished. If, if you've lost your baby, if you've lost your child, you're going to be less... And I know many people had to move house, they had to change their names. There's some astonishing stories of the measures that these families have had to take to avoid Alex Jones's followers. But there has got to be something, I think, in the idea that if you've lost your child, you are more equipped to take up this fight than somebody who hasn't. I, 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 am I making sense? I don't want to sound simplistic, but I'm just thinking yeah, about what no, would no, I do in those, because in, in those situations, the first thing you think of is your children. And if, the, if when you if boil it down, yeah. go on. When you boil it down to its basest form, they have literally lost everything they could possibly lose. Mm. So, what more can these insane people on the internet possibly take from them? The people who lost loved ones in Aurora, Colorado, to James Holmes with the Batman shooting. Yeah. The families in Buffalo. The families in Charleston, South Carolina. These this online presence will harass, 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 release your information, show up at your home, and they bully you into being quiet. And it's gotten to a point now where the Sandy Hook families, families from Uvalde, Texas, who, who lost their children in recent months, have finally realized there are more of us now who back them than are willing to stand by and watch them be harassed. The, the Alex Jones generation, the Trump generation, the, the Republican base here is slowly but surely, and it sounds terrible, but it's slowly but surely dying out. And every generation in the U.S. is more progressive than the previous. And that terrifies them so too. The, that terrifies them too. It, it does. That's why, that's why woke has to, been invented. That's why woke has become a thing to, to, to rail against and to fear and to fight. You have the Parkland survivors from Florida holding rally, being thrown out of congressional hearings for trying to make the point of we survived the death of 19 of our classmates, please do something. And now that the younger generations are willing to take that so. stand, some of these families have realized, hey, we're not doing this alone anymore. So maybe we can show him for what he is. And so Trump and Farage will latch on to that you know, to his insanity, because there are still people that are willing to pump it out online, unadulterated. And, and they and they, in, they pay their wages in a sense. So they, they 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 get their support and their, their their validity, and in some some ways their income from from the same base, from the same supporters. I got two more questions. So I, I'm so glad you were listening today. Um, you can probably guess what one of my questions is, which is what what I mean. You mentioned university, and I understand the role that critical thinking would play in a, in, a, in, a, in a process like this. But what broke the spell for you, Levy? What, what, what sort of... And how did you feel when it broke? I grew up in a very rural town in the state of Alabama. 1,800 people, very insulated. You know, my, my father was a teenager in the American South in the 50s and 60s. Okay. Who, you know, God bless him, kind of broke some of his bigoted views as I grew up, but yeah. when I got to an area of where I went to school with 200,000 people in the city, the university has 40,000 on campus, just being exposed to other people, other beliefs, um, and other ideas kind of opened it up for me. So because your and beliefs became unsustainable, all... essentially, you couldn't right. cling to these beliefs when there was so much evidence contradicting them in front of you every day. Absolutely. Being away from the echo chamber kind of broke the, the spell of this is what we believe, this is what we've always believed, and this is what we know to be true. Because eventually you get out in the world and realize none of this is actually true. 
That's, and, that's the incredible and, and that's thing from, from me. yeah. That's the incredible thing from the outside. No, none of it is actually true. The problem is perhaps, and and this is why your age might be relevant. And I hope your optimism isn't misplaced. But social media now has allowed these people to create. A, 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 a false ecosystem, hasn't it? A, a self-sustaining ecosystem where they support each other's delusions and they support each other's lies. It, it has, but what's happening, especially in, in the state, is now they're being relegated to having to create their own social media platforms. Yeah. Parlor, <laughs> Truth Social, the one that the crazy pillow guy created. Mm. Hmm. They've had to create their own because now I'm I'm 37, so I'm on that borderline of, of Gen X and Millennial. So I'm a centrist in the state. I own a couple of handguns. Do I need them? No, I would willingly give them up if that's what they wanted. But I'm also very socially progressive. Marry who you want, your body, your choice. As long as yes. you're not inconveniencing anyone, of course. do what you need to do. Live your life. We've gotten now to where people of my age group, the younger generations, have told these people the things you are saying and doing online is unacceptable. You have become a hazard to public health. You have become a hazard to the mental health and well-being of younger kids. Yeah. The, the bootlicking, essentially, of American police forces and believing that they can do no wrong is a health hazard to minorities in yeah. our country. And we have told them, look, this is unacceptable. We will not take this from you anymore. You've inflicted this on us for most of our life. You've made the world we live in almost unsustainable. So we're going to do what we can do to fix it and change it. If you want to create your own space, that's fine. But in the, the public space with the rest of the world, we're not going to let you do this and occupy the space anymore. Because ultimately, reality has to matter and objective truth has to forgive the pun, has, has to trump lies. Ultimately it does. And, and it just it's surprising to me how long it takes sometimes to get there. Levy, I, I, you're going to be one of my favourite callers of all time, I think, because not only have you really got my... Li li no, but you've, you've, you've brought something to the table I hadn't seen before, a better understanding of, of all the links, all the... Uh, almost the, 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 the sort of momentum that gets built up and, and where it leads. So I owe you one. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. And I hope we talk again. Um, wow. A lot of love coming in for Levy. And you can see why, can't you? This is why we do what we do sometimes. You, you, you get a call that just blows the doors off, whatever it is that is under discussion. But don't, don't be put off. I mean, he's lived it. The rest of us mostly are watching it or indeed enduring the horrors of seeing a loved one fall for it. And it is, it is profoundly important. There's a great piece in the Times today by um, by Hugo Rifkind that essentially points out that the disintegration of public truth is great news for those who weren't terribly keen on it in the first place. I'll read you a bit. He says, it was Sir Max Hastings, Boris Johnson's former editor at the Daily Telegraph, who said of our outgoing Prime Minister, I would not take Boris's word about whether it is Monday or Tuesday. As Prime Minister, Johnson knew every time he brazenly played with the truth that his supporters would find a way to believe him. Not much has changed. This weekend, his allies attacked the Commons Privileges Committee, which is pro all that. It's rigged. It's a witch hunt. It's a constitutional travesty. It is moving the goalposts. In other words, whatever it is about to say in its efforts to uncover the, the truth, his supporters should rest assured that alternative truths will be available. And Levy just used that phrase that Kellyanne Conway coined, the, the idea of there being alternative facts. That's what Nadine Doris is doing right now. She is cultivating alternative facts. It's what the Daily Mail is doing right now. They are cultivating alternative facts. This is an article by Hugo Rifkind about Alex Jones. And it is both supremely unsurprising and absolutely heartbreaking that it inevitably extends to include the current um, uh, Prime Minister and his ludicrous, ludicrous cheerleaders. And Truss is doing it too. Every time she says something wrong, she claims that it's been misinterpreted. Every time she makes a fool of herself, she blames it on the media. Every time she... Uh, I mean, she said something the other day. I'll read you the quote. Um, it is quite frustrating that female politicians always get compared to Margaret Thatcher, whereas male politicians don't get compared to Ted Heath. This was days after she dressed up as Margaret Thatcher for the first TV debate, as, as, as Rifkin points out. I mean, literally dressed up as her. 
quite incredible. But there we are. We, we, we are looking at a world in which people still thrive from essentially selling the notion that your beliefs do make something true. 11.51 is the time. And for me, at least, the best bit, one of the really interesting bits about that conversation with Levy and his very optimistic approach to, to progress and generational change is suddenly understanding why woke is so important to these people. Because if the direction of traffic really is towards the light, if we are heading back towards the days when objective reality and evidence mattered, where you didn't have alternative facts or alternative truths, where you didn't defend your... Uh, hero or heroine, regardless of what the, the facts and evidence were, then they need, they desperately need a new enemy. And and it needs to be the, the young people that are driving the change, driving the progress. And that's why anti-woke rhetoric is um, uh, so appealing to certain type of, of, of old, angry, ignorant people, I guess. Whew, James is in Birmingham. James, what would you like to say? Morning, James. Um, long time listener, long time caller, etc. Thank you. Et Thank you. <laughs> um, um, I think I want to come back to your question about what links all of those people. And I think, yeah. for me, the answer is the anti-establishment um, bandwagon. I've been listening to Alex Jones since 2001. Um, well, when I say listening to, aware of right. and, you know, having knowledge of what he says and what he does. He's always been a conspiracy theorist. He emerged out of the 9-11 um, okay, right, I didn't you, know that. You know, yeah. yeah, way back when. And he was at the forefront of the sort of, it was an inside job, he made films about it, he was, you know, he was bang on it from then. Okay. Um, over the last few years, of course, this has sort of moved away from the sort of what we thought was crazy republicanism. I just had to, had to, I had to lose the last 10 seconds there because you used the word and I think everyone can guess what it is. I, I'd have kept it in. I think we're all right with that one, actually. Yeah. It's, it's, no, not you. I'm not defending you. I'm just talking to the producer, James. Don't use the word again, whatever you do. <laughs> but the excrement deployed by nocturnal mammals is probably not a word that you should be using again on the <laughs> yeah. programme, all right? But, it, but I understand yeah. why you did. Carry on. My apologies, yeah. That's so all the, right. the the crazier wing of the Republican um, movement that he's moved towards since, you know, uh, maybe uh, about no. 2008, 9 and 10. It. Yeah, I've got it. Um, so all he's really doing is just jumping on bandwagons of, you know, he jumps, he, he attacks, he, his target audience is disaffected young men. Right you wing, know. right wing men. Right, so. Yeah, disaffected young, but, but, but initially... It was left wing. As I said, he was. They're not abortion. young, mate. They're not young because we're speaking about people's dads and people's father-in-law, fathers-in-law. Sure. We're not. I don't think I'd agree with you that they, they, they were young. But but I mean that's the incel end of it. There'll be different wings of his army, won't there? I'm going to say Absolutely. something. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you've, I've just had a moment of revelation, which doesn't happen to me very often, James, especially at my oh. age. So I'm going to get it out of there because the thing that's always baffled me when you say anti-establishment, right? I think yeah. these people couldn't be more establishment. That, that, and it happens in this country as well. You have conservative MPs, largely brexit MPs, mm -hmm. saying that they are anti-establishment or they complain about the establishment. Joe you know, Farage never shut up about the establishment. He's desperate to be in it. He's got his grubby little fish face pressed so hard against the window, it's left an imprint on his forehead. They, they, they love the establishment. But of course, if you've had predominantly right-wing governments for most of your life and your life is still rubbish... And you think you're right wing. You think you're on the side of, of, of low taxes and gun control and small state or whatever it is or anti abortion. You need, there needs to be something else. There needs to be something beyond the government. That means that your politicians, the politicians you vote for who make your life worse, it's not their fault that your life hasn't got better. Their hands have been tied. If only Boris Johnson could have escaped. And he, Johnson, to his eternal damnation, used the phrase deep state in the House of Commons. I, I mean, an incredible moment in British politics that's gone under-reported. But, of course, if you're a Donald Trump fan and you're looking at the skip fire that Donald Trump presides over, it can't be Donald Trump's fault, even though he's in charge. So there has to be something secret beyond the people in charge that explains why your life is still rubbish. And that's why Deep State has become part of their vocabulary. Deep State is an evolution from anti-establishment, right? The deep yeah, state is the much. establishment. That's it. Thank you for that. Thank you for leading me to that moment of clarity, James. Can, can you remember where you were before I so rudely interrupted you? 
Um, no, but I pretty much agree with what you've just said, and it was a perfect segue for you to launch yeah, from. So that's what it, because that's the big that. mystery. How can you be anti-establishment? You're the president of America. Answer, yeah, I'm really bad at it, or I'm, I'm, I'm filling my own pockets, and my punters, their lives have been turned, their lives aren't getting any better, so they have to believe that my hands are tied behind my back. And, and woke is probably part of that as well, this idea. I saw it yesterday in the papers, this idea that there's a, a left liberal establishment that actually runs everything. It was it was on Joe. It was one of those clips when they send out Vox Pops and some bloke starts talking about the establishment that's right. I'll try and find it for you. God, this I love it when this happens. It's all down to Levy and James. It's the callers. Put they like put pennies that they get put in my slot. And then the three melons come up on the uh on the fruit machine. Jacob's in Hednesford in uh Staffordshire, isn't it? Not not Herefordshire or Shropshire. Yeah, yeah. Hensford, yeah. No oh, one knows Hensford. where it is. <laughs> no, I, I know where it is. What would you like to Do say? You? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so no, I grew the, up in uh, Kidderminster, so, you know, it's, it's, oh, not, it's not a million that. miles yeah. away, is it? Go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I just tr I just challenged the notion that um, that this is the, uh, the Alex Jones phenomenon, if you will, is symptomatic of the culture wars. Really, I see it more as... So you should be um, fair, you're the first person to use the phrase culture wars today, so I don't, I don't yeah, know that we... I think people have touched upon this idea of, when we're speaking about social issues, there's this left-right divide, mainly in the United States, albeit. Hmm. But um, I think that it's more that people are drawn towards sensationalism. Yes. I remember a few years ago when you had uh, Oliver Norgrove on, and he said, he said a line, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along the lines of, I'm glad I'm not a bigger deal than I am. Uh, yeah. By which he meant... Just for people who don't say, know, and I, do you know what, I needed yeah, to, I, sure, hope he's, yeah. I hope he's well, but I just need to remind myself as well. He was one of the first vote leave people to sort of break ranks, wasn't he? And and, and yeah. sort of regret his, his role. I don't think I'm misrepresenting him, am I, when I say that? Right, but, but so, it, it's a bit of an odd reference, speaking about... Yes, it, it was an odd reference. Point, <laughs> no, 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 but, the, but the, point, the point I'm drawing upon is that he has very sort of nuanced, pragmatic opinions that yes. just don't generate... Um, they just don't garner the attention yeah. that is needed in the social media age. Um, yeah, okay. So, you know, if you look at um, boring, just say, boring old politicians in the past, like you referenced Ted Heath, Ted Heath um, wouldn't get anywhere nowadays in the social media age. And this might, be, this might be Starmer's problem. Uh, yeah, granted, it might be Starmer's problem. All right, then. Um, I'm gonna, what time is it? 11.59. What's my secret, then? Uh, what's your secret? Yeah, because I, I, I espouse essentially centrist views. I, I'm, I'm essentially quite boring in my outlook. I'm opposed to racism. I'm opposed to bigotry. I'm opposed to... Yeah, but James, it's not, it's, not, um, it's not what you actually believe. It's how you are perceived by other people. So you speak about the establishment before and how people on the right think that there's a left-wing establishment. Mm. And people on the left think there's a right-wing establishment. But obviously both opinions can't be true. It's just that there's this um, what I'd call a minority narrative nowadays everybody feels that they are in the minority but if you've got uh, yeah and, and, but one side ignores the evidence that which is why I, i'm very pleased with this so please don't explode it for me although i'll give you the opportunity to do so you need to invent sure. you need to invent the deep state if you're right wing and you've had right wing governments for most of your life you need to invent the deep state <laughs> yeah it's the conspiracy overton window as i yes, describe it that's it's a great the, way of describing the, it i'm nicking the, that not, by the way yeah, go on. <laughs> um, but you know, if, if Alex Jones, if Alex Jones, if all he ever did was go on about um, you know gay frogs and the Queen being a lizard, yes. you wouldn't get anywhere. It's the fact that it's mixed in with what comes across as mainstream uh, conservative opinion in the United States. I think that goes the other way. By the way, mm. uh, I can't think of an example off the top of my head. But um, these sensationalist views that uh, people are attracted to because they generate, um, a, a, you know, a, a sort of a controversial yeah. uh, theme, um, they don't they don't just come about in isolation. It's a it's a very gradual process. It's, it's a silent it's a very, revolution. It's a, very, it's a very human process. I think you're right. I, I mean, I don't. I'm sure you'd agree. It's not actually binary. It, I mean, it is going to be linked to no. what you describe as culture wars, and, and and there is also hugely a role for sensationalism, and also many other people. With with exactly the same words as Alex Jones wouldn't have 
wouldn't have got on the board. They wouldn't have. They wouldn't have rang rung a single bell. Um, uh, thank you, Jacob. I, I wish we'd had a little longer, but I'm already quite late for the news. Have we got that clip of the guy talking about this? Okay, I just play you this because a I I think that um, some of the work they do over at Joe. .co.uk is really good and B, it plays perfectly into what we were just saying about the establishment and about what, what it actually means and why they had to invent the deep state. That's my, that's my prize today. That's what I'm going home with. Why, why on earth did they start talking about the... Why would Boris Johnson talk about the deep state? Answer? Well, because if there's a deep state tying his hands and secretly running things, then all of his uselessness is both excused and explained at the same time. Why would Farage, I mean, almost inevitably Farage was tweeting this morning about, oh, there's clearly a deep state because Donald Trump. So if you've been voting for right-wing governments for your entire life and your life is still rubbish, then there must be a deep state because it can't possibly be the fact that right-wing governments have not improved your life in any way. Even though the evidence today of stuff like the water companies is 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 wonderful. Well, I, I, anyway, I'm very pleased with that. I'm almost reluctant to take any more calls in case you knock the gloss off my profound insight into the necessity of inventing the deep state in order to sustain support for right-wing politics. It was a pretty grim moment. Can we find the time when Johnson did it, when Johnson actually said deep state in the House of Commons? It's relatively recent, I think, but it was a much more significant moment than perhaps we appreciated at the time. But here's a useful example of someone who has fallen for it hook, line and sinker. I've been a Conservative for a long time. I've always seen them as an anti-establishment party. Who specifically do you mean by the establishment? I guess it's the left liberal establishment which runs the media, which runs the universities, which runs... Um, Whitehall. There you go, there you are. <laughs> the Conservatives are the anti-establishment party. Um, uh, and the, 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 the left liberal establishment that runs Whitehall. I, I mean, <laughs> just incredible, but hey-ho. And it matters, he's got as many votes as you've got. Uh, six minutes after 12 is the time. So there's still people waiting to, be, to talk to me about Alex Jones, but I, I, I'm going to move it, actually, because that line that I read you a moment ago, I'm going to move it to Johnson. I'm going to return to the conversation that we had yesterday, because I don't like the idea that we have got the British equivalent unfolding here. But I think the discovery... And I am allowing myself to use the word discovery for this. The discovery, and if you're listening to this going, oh, well done, James, I worked this out years ago. Just get knotted, all right? I don't believe you. I, I, it's been a moment of uncommon clarity on the programme today. Why, why do they have to invent the deep state answer in order to excuse the fact that the politics they have endorsed and espoused and indeed imposed for... The, uh, for the last 50 years have not helped in any way, shape or form the um, people that they promised. Here it is, yeah, like clockwork. Farage tweeted this morning, shocked to wake up. <laughs> I'm saying nothing. Shocked to wake up and hear about the raid on Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. The deep state truly does exist. So you're Nigel Farage, right? You've sold people Brexit. It's an absolute bloody disaster. What are you going to do? You, well, I can't, I'm not going to take any responsibility for it. Don't be ridiculous. I am the most stubborn skid mark on the underpants of British politics there has ever been, and I don't intend to disappear anytime soon. So what, how are you going to... Oh, there's a deep state. There's a deep state. That's why all, all of the stuff that I have espoused and stood for, whether you're Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, or Nigel Farage, why has it all gone to absolute pot answer? Oh, there's a deep state frustrating us at every turn. Why would they want to frustrate you at every turn? Don't ask uncomfortable questions. So I, I like that. And here is the question then, for the final hour of the programme. Are we seeing something very similar being undertaken in Britain now? With, with this determination not to uh, allow the inquiry into Boris Johnson's misleading of the House of Commons to go ahead. Yesterday was astonishing when four Conservative MPs came under concerted attack from right-wing media, in this case the Daily Mail, even though one of them had already stepped down from the committee. They, they go in again today, not quite as viciously, not quite as violently, but they, they still go in. And it is an absolute determination to avoid scrutiny, to get Boris Johnson away from the microscope. So let's have a look here. A senior Tory MP on the committee probing Boris Johnson over Partygate faced calls to quit the inquiry team yesterday 
from the Daily Mail, but they don't put that in the article, <laughs> from me, it's just from us, um, over after it was claimed that he labelled the Prime Minister dishonest. That That's mad. I don't know if I conveyed quite how mad I think this is yesterday, satisfactorily. This is a real moment in British media. The Prime Minister is dishonest. The Prime Minister is dishonest. This is not an opinion. This is counting. The Prime Minister is dishonest. The Prime Minister has cheated on his wives. The Prime Minister has lied about his private life, his personal life, his political life. The Prime Minister has been fired from a front bench role or from a, 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 a minister, shadow ministerial role in the Conservative Party for lying. You cannot be excluded from any role in this country for stating that the current Prime Minister is dishonest. That would be like being told, well, you said it was raining last Tuesday when it was raining, therefore I'm never ever going to uh, allow you to comment on the weather again. Or indeed, not just the weather, I'm never going to let you do anything ever again. You can, In fact, that's it, you're unemployable. When it was raining last Tuesday, and you said it was raining in the middle of that rainstorm, when it was raining... That means you can't be trusted to, to, to investigate whether or not it's raining today. It's incredible what they're doing. Sir Bernard Jenkin, arch-Brexiteer. It's not a phrase I've used much on the programme because I think it makes them sound like musketeers, whereas in fact they are muppets. But arch-Brexiteer, Sir Bernard Jenkin, they don't put that in the, in the paragraph that they're writing about. He's one of three remaining Conservative MPs on the Commons Privileges Committee, which is looking into whether Mr Johnson misled Parliament. <laughs> and it has now emerged, oh no, here it is, it has now emerged that Sir Bernard, a leading Brexiteer and former deputy chairman, allegedly suggested that Mr Johnson joining the Vote Leave camp ahead of the 2016 EU referendum would be a disaster. They're quoting Dominic Cummings now, in order to try and discredit this leading Brexiteer. But the point isn't so much that. What Sir Bernard allegedly told Dominic Cummings about Boris Johnson before the Brexit referendum, he says he has no recollection of using these words. Talk about a circular firing squad. These are the words he said. He's dishonest, a philanderer. A philanderer is someone who cheats on their wife. Would anyone like to ring me now and tell me that Boris Johnson is not a philanderer? that stating that Boris Johnson is a philanderer is simply akin to stating that the sun came up this morning and went down last night. Boris Johnson is a philanderer. That is not an opinion. That is a statement of fact. It's like saying Boris Johnson is a politician. It's like saying Boris Johnson is a blonde. It's like saying Boris Johnson is a man. He is also a philanderer. But the best-selling newspaper in the country today is contending that if you are of the view that Boris Johnson is a man or has blonde hair or is a politician or is a philanderer, all of which are equally and demonstrably true, all four of those phenomena apply equally and demonstrably to Boris Johnson, but if you reportedly said that once to somebody who you don't really trust but today fits your agenda, even though he can't actually remember saying those words themselves, the rumour that he once said them to someone that you can't trust and who really did play a role, he says, in getting Boris Johnson out of Downing Street. That's that's a reason not to try. Absolutely bonkers. Uh, these are the other phrases that apparently disqualify him from uh, taking part in the inquiry into whether or not Boris Johnson misled the House of Con Co Commons. Uh, the backbenches of the Conservative Party need no reminders about how to dispose of a failing leader. They've listened, so you understand, that they've picked the quotes that they think prove Bernard Jenkin can't be, can't be trusted. And here's an example. The backbenches of the Conservative Party need no reminders about how to dispose of a failing leader. That, that apparently means he can't be trusted to sit on a committee investigating whether or not Boris Johnson misled the House of Commons, brackets, which of course he did, close brackets. Well, any more evidence of, of why he can't, he can't be trusted? We are looking for a change in the capability and the character of the government so, so that we can have confidence that nothing as clumsy or mortifying as this Partygate episode could ever happen again. How, how is that controversial? Nobody wants anything as mortifying or as clumsy as the Partygate episode ever to happen again. The sight of a British Prime Minister standing up in the House of Commons and claiming that he had not attended any parties, no, claiming that there hadn't been any parties, 
then standing up a couple of weeks later and claiming that, well, actually there were parties but I'd never attended them. And standing up a couple of weeks after that and saying that, well, actually there were parties and I did attend them but I didn't realise there were parties. And then standing up and saying, I've been fined by the police, I'm very sorry for attending parties. How can anybody not want to move towards a political world in which that doesn't happen again? So, so there it is. I still don't fully understand why they're so desperate for this not to happen, because it's only the male and Nadine Dorries, as far as I can tell. Oh, and Bill Cash. Because the other story in the newspaper today is actually in the Daily Telegraph, and that is more interesting, or at least significant. The Daily Telegraph, which has historically been to Boris Johnson as the Beano is to Dennis the Menace reports that former Downing Street figures are preparing to give evidence claiming Boris Johnson misled Parliament over what he knew about the Partygate scandal. This newspaper has talked to three people contacted by the committee investigating whether the Prime Minister misled MPs about what he knew about the lockdown breaking gatherings. All three have alleged that Mr Johnson did not give the fullest account of the facts as he knew them at the time. One has already agreed to give evidence to the committee and two others are considering likewise. You know the lefty liberal establishment that that fellow was talking about a minute ago? Yeah, they actually worked in Downing Street under Boris. They're the people that can't be trusted. This is genuinely staggering that you have people like Nadine Dorries and Ian Duncan Smith trying to call off an inquiry or trying to, to, I don't know, are they trying to rig it? Do they want these people replaced with people that they think can be trusted not to hand down a verdict that they don't like? And everybody knows what the verdict is because everybody knows he's guilty. If the question is only how guilty and what's going to come out in this inquiry that would make those, ah, that would make those of us who supported Boris Johnson through thick and thin, or thick and thick in Nadine Doris's case, those of us who supported Boris Johnson through thick and thin are going to look absolutely irredeemably and irreparably awful if the stuff that seems likely to come out in this investigation comes out, up to and including the current editor of the Daily Mail. That's it, isn't it? We need another topic. That's it. That's all it is. They, this cannot possibly go ahead, because if it does, people like these three people, the Daily Telegraph have spoken to, that well-known lefty liberal organ full of Marxist rhetoric and, and doing the business of the deep state, the Daily Bloody Telegraph has found three people who are going to blow the blooming doors off Boris Johnson's lies and defences, which means the more slavish your devotion to Boris Johnson was, the more disgusting you're going to look when the truth comes out, ergo the more desperate, and don't forget that Ian Duncan Smith led his leadership campaign, so the more disgusting and desperate, you're, the more disgusting you're going to look when the truth comes out, the more desperate you are to keep a lid on the truth, and the more desperate you are to somehow banjax this inquiry. Go on, tell me I'm wrong. 03456060973. Why are a small number of conservative politicians and the edit editors of the Daily Mail desperate, desperate to stop this inquiry into Boris Johnson by the Privileges Committee, consisting until relatively recently of a majority of conservative MPs? Why are they so desperate to stop it from happening? 03456060973. I'll take whatever answers you've got. You can agree or disagree with my own um, theory on this one. But the other question I've got for you, having spent an hour talking about Alex Jones, talking about the truth, talking about how your beliefs do not make something true, is it fair to put Boris Johnson and his supporters in the same category as Donald Trump and his supporters? Why do we put up with it? I asked you about Alex Jones at the top of the 11 o'clock hour. Why do we put up with this? Here, here's, here's the bit I was telling you about with Boris Johnson. Here, here's the... Uh, Here's the clip. This is absolute... And, and Farage is the only other person who uses this phrase with a straight face. He's used it this morning to describe the fact that the FBI, which is run by a man appointed by Donald Trump, has, avoid, has um, raided Donald Trump's home in Florida because he took lots of documents from the White House that he wasn't allowed to take. There is, docu there is photographic evidence that he tried to flush some of these documents down actual toilets in the White House. So what do you do if the bloke that you voted for is so obviously corrupt and depraved? Answer, you claim he's the victim of the deep state. What do you do if you are the bloke who's completely corrupt and depraved? Well, I'll show you. And some people will say, as I, as I leave office, that this is the end of... They, they, yep, they, will, they will say this is the end of Brexit. They will, oh yes. 
Listen to Deathly Hush. <laughs> Deathly Hush. Uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the leader of the opposition and the, and the deep state will prevail in its plot to haul us back into alignment with the EU as a prelude uh, to our eventual return. That's absolutely appalling, and we should have made a bigger fuss at the time. Why is Brexit going so badly? The deep state, a non-existent, mythical phenomenon designed to excuse Boris Johnson from being Boris Johnson and to excuse Boris Johnson, the chief architect of Brexit, from the failings and failures of Brexit. And it's exactly what Nigel Farage has done this morning with Donald Trump. Donald Trump appointed the director of the FBI, and the FBI are now investigating him to the extent of raiding his home in pursuit of documents that he has taken from the White House. If you're following the January the 6th investigation, the scale of the corruption is absolutely off the, off the, off the page, off the planet. But what do you do if you've hitched yourself to this bandwagon? How do you possibly excuse the fact that the fellow you help sell to the American people is absolutely bent? Answer, you need a new enemy. And that's why the deep state comes in. So the more I talk, the more I think I may not take any calls at all this hour because my dander is hot. No, don't worry, I will. But the more I talk, the more I think, actually... The parallels between Trump and Johnson that we've been so reluctant to draw, so ashamed of, perhaps, on a patriotic level, I think they're very hard to deny now. What's the difference between Boris Johnson blaming the deep state for his own failings and failures and Nigel Farage blaming the deep state for Donald Trump's failings and failures? What's the difference? What's the difference between Johnson and Trump? 03456060973. Now we see their supporters desperate to avoid scrutiny. Nadine Dorries calling it a witch hunt. That's straight out of the Steve Bannon playbook. This is a wonderful opportunity, you might argue, for Boris Johnson to prove that he's absolutely squeaky clean, that he wasn't aware that he was deliberately misleading the House of Commons, except, unfortunately, the Daily Telegraph, which was paying him 250 grand a year for a column until about 20 minutes ago, the Daily Telegraph says it's found three people who were working in Downing Street at the time and who believe that the Prime Minister has misled MPs about what he knew about the lockdown breaking gatherings. How, wh why are we putting up with this when I, I plan it out like this and I am not using lefty liberal establishment figures. I'm using the Daily Telegraph who themselves are speaking to members of the Downing Street staff and yet there's people still lapping it up up and down this country and Liz Truss is talking almost exclusively to them as she leads the field in the race to be our next Prime Minister. Pete's in Bristol. Pete, what's going on? I think we're a full-blown quack like a duck, walks like a duck situation, aren't we? Now you've said the whole deep state thing. Yeah. Um, the other thing, he's surrounding himself by people who are just dime a dozen, and this is their career. If, if they get kicked out now, they can't go on to another job. I mean, you can move on from LBC, I could change my employer and stuff like that. If they go, they have nothing of value to add, so they are literally protecting their entire career right now. But he's not, they're not going to get him to stay as Prime Minister by calling off this inquiry or by, or by getting it populated with people like them. They're just going to avoid stuff coming out that might... I mean, the, the, the problem is, mate, let me phrase this correctly, I think what we're both doing here is suggesting that shame is the motivation for people who are actually shameless. That's the only bit of it that doesn't work. So we need more flesh on the bones of what the embarrassment would be. It's not that they're going to lose their jobs, because he's gone, he's resigned. He's not going to be Prime Minister this time next month. Which means that the, the job, you know, that why don't they want him to be investigated now? Because stuff's going to come out that's shaming for them, but they are shameless people. That's the only bit I haven't got. Um, because <laughs> this is just a test for them to show that they can be faithful lapdogs. They have nothing else to contribute, con contribute, but that they can just literally stow the line and be like absolutely faithful at anything else. So this is just, it's just like a interview for them now. Yeah. They will protect anyone at all costs. We'll keep saying the same thing. We'll go out and do the news media rounds and protect you. And this is the same what thing. What about is, Bill uh, Cash then? Why is Bill Cash so desperate for this not to happen? He's, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's coming towards the end of his career. He's already got his knighthood. 
Uh, I'm not sure about Bill Cash. Like, that's the experience. But the one thing I'll say that it is, it is full-blown quack like a duck walk, like a duck situation. Yeah, I, I, it's, is, it's, it's comparable to Trump, isn't it? When Farage talks about the deep state being the reason why the FBI, um, led by a man appointed by Donald Trump, is investigating Donald Trump and having to raid his house because of all the documents that he um, uh, took with him when he left. The one similarity that still exists, but I don't think people talk about more anymore, is Russian money. Trump had a lot of questions about. Oh Russian yeah, money. I, I, I hear you. No, there's background there. I mean, I'm not. I'm not glossing over what you're saying. I just don't want to get too distracted from it because Trump's doing the thing now. The statement he said. He's saying America has become a corrupt country. Uh, they even broke my safe. It's. It's. Uh, I'm conscious because we spoke about Alex Jones for an hour. I'm conscious of the boiling a frog analogy again. But this is, and I think we're in a better position than America. I really do because. At least the Daily Telegraph is going after the truth, it would seem. Three former government figures have spoken to the Telegraph. All three said they believed that Mr Johnson had misled Parliament. So why would the Daily Mail be desperate for this inquiry not to go ahead? Glenn's in Bordeaux. Glenn, what would you like to say? Well, I think the problem that Johnson's got, uh, and I'm sure I read this somewhere, I think it was Maughan, the barrister chappy. Mm. His problem is one of legal jeopardy because... When he comes before this committee, they're planning to put him under oath. Are they? And that means, yeah, yeah, no, okay. I read that. Really? And they can, okay. and if they do, if they do, then anything he says, as you know, uh, well, it is just legal jeopardy. It will lead to perjury, or he has to tell the truth. He has to tell the truth, or he has to lie under oath. All right, so and why would the Daily Mail be so desperate for it not to go ahead? That explains why he doesn't want to do it. Uh, but Nadine Dorries isn't going to be across what you've just described. I'm not sure I am either, actually, for the record. But why are the Daily Mail so desperate for this thing to be banjacked, to be called up? Well, why would any of his gang be? Well, right, because the mean, Telegraph they... aren't. The Telegraph aren't, you see. So, I, I mean, this is a little bit of my pet oh, well, subject. Perhaps, perhaps because Paul Dacre actually has colluded with him. I don't know. But clearly there are a lot of people out there, I think, who would not want Johnson having to tell the truth. Yeah, but you just said, you see, you gave up a maybe, which is unlikely to be true, and then you stuck an I don't know at the end of it. And I'm the same, and I do this for a living. I watch this rubbish more closely than anybody else in the country. And, and I, I struggle to come up with a really consolidated, substantive answer to the question of why the Daily Mail are so desperate for this thing to be called off, while the Daily Telegraph are essentially giving us a sneak preview of what's going to happen if it goes ahead. And it's going to be absolutely horrible for Boris Johnson. Let me quote. All three said they believed that Mr Johnson had misled Parliament. One said, on the facts, he was definitely at lockdown breaking events and he knew they were happening and therefore what he said to the House was knowingly inaccurate. Another, when asked if Mr Johnson misled Parliament, said absolutely, damn well he did. And a third said of the Prime Minister's knowledge of lockdown breaking parties that he knew what was going on. So why would the Mail be desperate for this not to go ahead and why would the Telegraph be essentially fighting from the other angle, when until relatively recently they were the president and the vice president of the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil Boris Johnson fan club. And it is one of those days where, largely by accident, I think we've stumbled across something of, of, of some significance. Um, I, I don't know what you do now if you are still in the, in the fan club, if you still... Leave Brexit out of it, if you're still of the view that, that, that Boris Johnson was deserving of your support or worthy of your admiration. Um, but I guess you probably still quite like the look of Donald Trump as well, don't you? So you're not even disagreeing with me that they're peas in a pod. That's what you like. We should probably have been a little bit more aware of that. If you look at who liked Trump and Johnson and then the sort of little poodle poppling along behind them, Nigel Farage, then they, they might, you must have seen things that united them for you. You must have seen things that they had in common. And that's what you liked about them. Those of us who... Uh, 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 bear the burden of being fair-minded and honest. We, we resisted, and patriotic, of course, we resisted the idea that Boris Johnson was as bad as Donald Trump because that would mean terrible things for our country. But now they're off. Both of them are off, although I think the likelihood of a Trump return is still higher than the likelihood of a Johnson return. Why is there this desperation for him not to be investigated? Answer, because they know... I, I mean, what else have you got? We know why why they are um, 
we know they're guilty. We know he's guilty. Everybody knows he's guilty. The people defending him know he's guilty. But why would they not want... Uh, I, anyway, Duncan's in Grantham. The Trump-Johnson parallels. Do you know, Duncan, I've... I've I mean, I've made them, but I've always made them very reluctantly, and I've always caveated them with, well, of course, he's nowhere near as bad, really, but perhaps he is. Well, I, I think you've got more faith than I have, James, because I've always seen Boris as a bit of a, a mini-Trump, Britain-Trump. Mm -hmm. There's there's so much that they have in common, and, and not just them, but the people that they they communicate with, the people who listen to what they say. As you've said previously, this wholesale assault on truth and go, I agree with that. They they say the things that confirm my biases. I'm happy to accept whatever easily so provable... Because Johnson was life. cleverer at doing it in slightly more coded and subtle ways. But why would Nigel Farage fans have flocked adoringly towards the altar of Boris Johnson if they didn't see peas in a pod? And, and, and Trump comes into the picture as well. I, I, I mean... This isn't in Johnson's defence, and it might also apply to Trump, is that if they thought that power and influence rested on being the most liberal person in the room, they probably would have done that. Do you, do you see what I mean? It's the absence of principle and beliefs. They probably would have pretended to be the most liberal person in the room if they thought that would deliver power and, and influence. But the opportunism of it and the ugliness of it is, is actually impossible to not not compare, I think. Well, I feel that in, in terms of that broad appeal, at least from what I've seen, both of them are trying to appeal to a very specific demographic. Mm. And I think, unfortunately, it's continuing with the Tory party post-Johnson because yes, both is. Nadine Dorries and Rishi Sunak are all of the things that they're campaigning on, all of the promises they're making to, to people who are of a more liberal bent are disgusting. You know, Rishi Sunak's talking about people who vilify the country being labelled as extremists and having to go to some course to learn to be more patriotic. That's that's some real Orwellian stuff. Mm. But, you know, you wouldn't be at all surprised if, if Donald Trump had said that. He was trying to introduce some legislation about changing well, the curriculum gone, in America. No, you're, I mean, and they've both gone all in, Johnson and Trump gone all in on the deep state, which I, I, I mean... I. I it's the only way they can continue to evade responsibility for reality is by claiming that there's some secret invisible... It's often quite an anti-Semitic trope as well, the deep state, but they, 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 I mean, they haven't gone all in on it being Jewish, secretive Jewish power brokers pulling all the strings behind behind the scenes. But the, the, the deep state is, is, is the only way that they can avoid responsibility for what they, for what they have actually done. It's not my fault that I presided over this because my hands were tied. I couldn't actually do it. Woo. I, I, the, the armchair socialist in me is going to come out now, mm. but I think that uh, I think that right wing figures. I think you'll find that we all we, we all own that armchair, don't we? Under under social. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no, that's yeah, communism. Sure. Carry just, on. You know, I'm, I'm I'm really going to you know that yeah. there'll be people on Twitter of of the Johnson band going, oh, you know, woke whatever, but they always need a scapegoat. Mm. I mean, whether whether it's the deep state, whether it's the EU, whether it's George Soros, there's always got to be someone that's making things worse and they're the only one that can fix it and as far as the people who follow them go i've said this about a lot of conspiracy theories mm. i think it's about fear it's a fear of of randomness that things just happen things go wrong and there has to be someone pulling the strings as a sense of comfort no, yeah. things aren't just going wrong yeah, and, and, of, and, and well you know, and if you voted for the people in charge then that sense of comfort becomes even more desperate you, you or the search for that sense of comfort becomes even more desperate nadine dory's on sunday if this witch hunt continues it will be the most egregious abuse of power witnessed in westminster it will cast serious doubt not only on the reputation of individual mps sitting on the committee but on the processes of parliament and democracy itself she's talking about conservative MPs, and she's talking about suspending or calling on off, trying to call off an inquiry into whether or not Johnson misled the House of Commons and the Daily Telegraph has found three members of his own team who are pretty adamant that he did. Back in April, God, it feels like years ago, did you deliberately mislead the House at the dispatch box about Partygate and the Prime Minister replied no. And then we're back to Max Hastings, his former boss at the Daily Telegraph, who said, I would not take Boris's word about whether it is Monday or Tuesday. And then we come to the Daily Mail, which is trying to malign uh, Bernard Jenkin, a prominent Brexiteer, that dreadful word, 
um, because he has described Boris Johnson as dishonest and a philanderer, which is like describing me as having thinning hair and a microphone in front of me. 12.39 is the time. Uh, thank you, Duncan. Paul's in Weybridge. Paul, what, what, what's actually happening here? I haven't yet, between you and me, professionally speaking, I haven't quite found the way into this yet. I haven't quite found the way of communicating my own thoughts and, 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 and fears. But we're getting closer and we'll keep pushing. What do you think's going on? Uh, morning, Joe. Well, good afternoon, James. Hello, um, it's this aspect of the, uh, the deep state deep which state. concerns me. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it exists. But it's not as deep as anybody thinks, and I think it's hiding in plain sight. Go on. Um, the deep state is, as I said, I, you know, I, I have no illusions that somewhere there is some guy sitting in a, an office stroking his Persian cat and controlling <laughs> the world. It, it, it is Bob Johnson. It is um, Lebedev. It is the Tory donors. And they are now, um, by getting him to stand up in the House of Commons and talk about uh, the deep state. So, so you mean people, to... people secretive, the, the, secretively wielding power and influence, or expecting yeah. influence? But and, they're and... right in front of us. We know that we know they're there. Yeah, I don't think them. calling them the deep state is helpful. Actually, I, 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 I no, mean, just you see what? Yeah, yeah I, I don't think they are. That's it. I don't think there is a deep state. It's a sort of shallow, semi-hidden state. Yeah. And what they're up to, and Johnson did it, he used something straight out of the Bannon playbook in the House of Commons. Yeah. The, the, the acronym is DAVO. I'm sure you've come across it. Deny, yeah. attack, reverse victim and offender. Yeah. That's what he did. And that yeah, Johnson, uh, uh, Trump today saying that America is corrupt and, and, and I, I'm the victim and, and the deep state. So DAVO, that's the reverse victim and offender bit of it always, isn't it? Yeah, they're identical. They're identical. I absolutely agree, but I think that's mm. what's happened, and I think he thinks that's a really clever thing to do. I'll say that we've got a deep state here, knowing full well it doesn't exist in in reality, but, but he does know there are people pulling his strings. Here's a bloke I put in the House of Lords, That's you're talking about Lebedev Jr., the son of a man who's currently sanctioned in Canada for being the... Uh, mm for being part of Vladimir Putin's inner circle, the same man that Boris Johnson visited in Italy without having any um, uh, security or, or advisors present. He also put in the House of Lords a bloke called Crudders, who is, uh, w w w got into trouble at one point for his fundraising activities, but he is leading the attempt to get Boris Johnson on the actual ballot to, so he could come back in again. And these, I, I guess this is how democracies fail, isn't it? If, the, if they succeed, and I don't think they're going to, but if they had succeeded, it would be the ultimate dismantling of democracy, which is what nearly happened in America on January the 6th. I don't like this conclusion that they're peas in a pod, but you need to phone me and tell me why I'm being silly. And, I, and you will get through. I know there's a temptation on Twitter to pretend that you can't get through. You're too clever to get... You try and get through, but you're so clever. James won't talk to anyone as clever as me. Just give us a buzz, seriously, and tell me why it's ridiculous to suggest that Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are the same. 0345 6060973. Roy's in Glastonbury. Roy, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Hello. Yeah, my theory is that um, it uh, sadly all comes down to being about Brexit again. Yeah, go on. Um, yeah, my, Michael Heseltine has, has come out and said if Boris goes, then Brexit could easily start dismantling. We know how terrible Brexit is, and it's but Boris is going. He's going. Like, he's he not... is going. Yeah, but if he if he's then sanctioned by the Privileges Committee. Or if he's found guilty, as it were, yes. you know, which he will case. be, which he will which be. He will it's be. impossible for then him not to be, be unless they clone he, twelve Nadine Dorrises and put them all on the same committee. God forbid, exactly. and put them all then on the he, same committee. That's right. Then he may be sanctioned by Parliament. He may he may even lose his seat if they condemn him to more than what ten years out the sitting in the in right. Parliament or something. He, he then could lose his seat. It would then be much, because he wants to make a comeback. And, they, and at least the people like Daily Telegraph and Daily Mail, they think, well, no. okay, if, if, if Liz Truss is not going to last long. The Telegraph you know, are not in there. The Telegraph and the Mail are on different pages on this. They're at loggerheads. The Telegraph is doing, and I've said this before, their news pages are rather good at the moment, have been for a while. Their comment yeah. pages, more comedy, more unintentional comedy on the Daily Telegraph's comment pages than you'll find anywhere else in Christendom. But on the news page, <coughs> excuse me, 
they're getting this right. So it's wrong to lump them in together on this. It's the male that are oh. desperate for it not to All go right, out. Well, the male. Well, I still, I still think my theory holds up. That they see Boris. What Boris really won. Brexit to both leave, and they and I don't I don't normally call him Boris. I'm not going to call him Boris. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> and um, they so they think because Brexit is is going to continue to sort of fester and not and and uh, having Liz Truss at the helm, she's not going to really uh, be able to rebuff Brexit like Johnson can, and she so probably won't last fear. long. I'd he like... wants to stand again. And yet it yeah, is okay, you're the covering committee. too much ground because you can't. I think Brexit might be part of it. I thought it was unhelpful for Michael Heseltine to say what he said actually because it, it, yeah. it just gave it gave the lie to what a lot of what Boris Johnson said. It's supposed to the idea that there's just waiting in the wings for it. That, it. that no one is waiting to undo it. All we're doing is waiting for it to become impossible to pretend that it wasn't awful. And, and that's what Keir Starmer's policy is, I believe. It's just a question of how long it's going to take. You can't force people to undo it. You can't force people into reverse. There was a brief chance of a second referendum, but that's gone. But I, I disagree with Heseltine on this. When, when Johnson goes, the most successful liar about Brexit goes, and therefore the process of people accepting the truth about Brexit probably gets accelerated because the uh, most successful liar has gone, but but it doesn't begin to unravel because, the, the, you know, Liz Truss is going to lie about it. Ian Duncan Smith is going to carry on lying about it or being deluded about it. I, I don't know, but the, uh, but the path back has got to be part of it as well, trying to shut down any possible path back. What a tangled web we weave, eh? I'm um, a rather good point made by one of the American commentators on this is that Donald Trump wanted people to be locked up for 10 years for the crime of putting graffiti on a statue but um, stealing and squirreling away documents from the White House when the FBI investigate that or that allegation that's the end of the Republic as we know it his response has been well predictably histrionic but his response to what Andrew Feinberg is the White House Congress and politics uh, correspondent at the Independent, based in Washington DC, and, and he joins me now. In, in your own words, and well, obviously in your own words, you're not going to use anybody else's. Um, how big a deal? What exactly has happened, and how big a deal is this? Well, I'll start off with your second question. This is a very big deal. This has never happened before in in U.S. history. Uh, the Justice Department has never executed a search warrant on the home of a former president before. And what brought this about uh, is something that is actually really simple. Uh, when you are the president of the United States, uh, you don't have a, a security clearance per se. Uh, you are allowed to see whatever classified information you want and uh, and keep those documents uh, in in your office okay. uh, or will secured storily uh, s securely stored hopefully but once you are no longer president at noon on january 20th 2021 uh, Donald Trump, uh, to borrow a metaphor here, turned into a pumpkin <laughs> and no longer had the ability to lawfully possess any any classified information and actually any government records. They're the property of the government. They're not the property of, the, of Donald Trump. Right. And so what has happened is the Justice Department, the FBI, executed a search warrant looking for documents that were the property of the United States. These are documents that are known to be missing, Andrew? Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, when when he left office, uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff missing. And uh, <laughs> earlier this year, he turned over 15 boxes of documents to the National Archives. They found documents within those boxes that were so classified they couldn't even be described in an unclassified manner. Good and apparently there are more. And this is simply a, a property case uh, when, when you get down to it. As in theft? Yes, as in theft. Do we have any inklings about what might be in the documents? Uh, no, we do not. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some are benign. Uh, some are probably very, very important. And given that the FBI felt that they needed to actually go and get them, uh, there might be 
uh, information in those documents that could have severe consequences for U.S. national security uh, if they were to fall into the wrong hands. And really, that's what uh, this is also about. This is property and this is a national security case, it, it appears. And pertinent, of course, to remind people that the director of the FBI was handpicked by Donald Trump. So the uh, entirely predictable attempt to sort of claim that he's being the victim of the deep state or that his detractors are conspiring to to topple him or that the entire country has, has become corrupt is, even by Donald Trump's standards, more pathetic than usual. You, you could say that. The, the former president always likes to play the victim, but in, in this case, uh, it, it is a bit rich because the man at the top of the FBI, Christopher Wray, is a Donald Trump appointee. Mm. And this is not, uh, as he as he likes to say, Democrats going after him. This is the FBI looking for stolen stuff. <laughs> um, you're quite a, 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 a clear-eyed chronicler of how Trump supporting media reports this stuff as well. I'm enjoying your Twitter feed. There's one, and I'll ask you that. I mean, how? how I mean, Fox News. There's one headline you've drawn attention to. It says source colon. FBI agents grabbed documents and boxes without going through them properly. That sounds to me like they're floundering a little. Uh, yeah, I, as I as I tweeted I, yesterday, I don't even know what that means. Uh, in in a search warrant under, under U.S. law, I'm not sure how things work in the U.K., but when the federal government goes to federal court for a search warrant, they have to say what they are looking for, where they will find it and why they need it and so if a judge signed off on that then they met that burden and and it's it's not a, an incredibly high burden but sure. it's pretty high it, it's a probable cause standard which means they can't just go fishing uh, if they if they went to mar-a-lago yesterday looking for documents they most likely knew what sort of documents would be there and where they would be found and they and that they would be evidence of a crime. I, I mean, it is remarkable to reflect upon what they might have been looking for. What in the ski? And, and of course, it being so unprecedented means you probably can't answer this question. What happens next? What, 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 what do we know? What happens next? I mean, what might we expect to come out? Would, would the FBI make a statement? We're in uncharted I, I, waters, aren't we? I, I doubt you will we'll see any any statements coming out of the Justice Department or FBI. This is an ongoing investigation, and as a rule, they do not comment on ongoing investigations. Mm -hmm. If there is more documentation put into the public record, it will most likely be if this case uh, goes to a grand jury for an indictment and the grand jury votes out that indictment, and uh, then you'll see more. But given uh, the sensitivities of some of these uh, documents that they may, ha may have found, uh, you may not see much more uh, than that, sure. uh, particularly if they're very, very, uh, very sensitive. Andrew Feinberg, many thanks indeed for um, pursuing that Washington beat, as I say, for the independent newspaper. Uh, I, I hope we talk again, actually. That was very helpful. Um, 12.54 is the time. The president's statement inevitably includes everyone from Hillary Clinton through to claims of corruption and all sorts of um, shaggy-style um, denial of responsibility. You can't make it up. And, and, of course, it makes the fact that today we've arrived fairly conclusively at the thought that Boris Johnson is... Very similar in outlook, and at least his supporters are behaving almost identically in their desperation to avoid investigation into whether or not he lied to the House of Commons. It's a strange, strange day.